Own the show you're watching on DVD for only $29.95. Call 1-800-708-1776 or visit shophistorychannel.com, your source for all your History Channel favorites. Though boneyards come in all shapes and sizes, their purpose is always the same. Get the job done. A B-52 being chopped to shreds. A Titan ICBM facility blown to rubble. Fighters and ships going down in a blaze of weapons testing. Or great ships burned and sheared into scrap for the furnace. But sometimes, people form strong attachments to machines and vessels, and against all odds, find ways to save them from the boneyard. For one man, it's the fate of an extraordinary aircraft, far ahead of its time. Today, most of them are spread over a desert boneyard in Arizona. All are scheduled to be shredded and burned. It's called the Starship, and from the day it was introduced in 1986, it was considered one of the most unique and beautiful aircraft ever to fly. I love this Starship. I loved it from the first time I saw one when I was flying a little Cessna years ago. I was washing my little airplane and I heard the distinctive noise of a starship going by. And I'll never forget it. It's just the most beautiful thing. The little hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I thought, wow, you know, that is the coolest plane. It was unlike any other aircraft in history. Its revolutionary features, the forward canard wing, the pusher engines, and carbon fiber construction all reflected the brilliance of aerospace designer Bert Rutan. I think that he is the preeminent designer of our age, maybe ever. He's designing Spaceship Two for Virgin Galactic to take tourists to space. The man is a genius. He's way ahead of his time. Rutan designed this starship with a number of components unique for aircraft in the 1980s. The canard, or tail in front feature, on Rutan's experimental private aircraft had long demonstrated their outstanding stability and maneuverability over conventional craft. With no fuselage between them, the Starship's design allows the two pusher engines to be mounted close together. With propellers operating only inches apart, each engine performs more efficiently by producing nearly centerline thrust. What's less familiar is the Starship's component materials. It's the first certificated all-composite airplane. No other business class airplane has an all-composite wing and fuselage. The composite wings bend in turbulence, so the net effect is the ride is unlike anything else. Passengers tell me all the time that they can't believe how smooth this airplane operates in turbulence over the Rocky Mountains. Composites are layers of carbon fiber which are embedded in resin. They were then molded into the Starship's design. This composite material was tested to be more than three times stronger than aircraft aluminum. Another revolutionary feature for its day is the Starship's instrumentation, referred to as an all-glass cockpit. Instead of the usual mechanical dials and gauges found in normal aircraft of the period, it mounted a fully integrated set of instruments all connected to a central computer and displayed on TV screens. It's actually the first certificated all-glass cockpit in general aviation. It was looked at as being very gee whiz technology in its day. Of course, nowadays, virtually every airplane rolling off the assembly lines have that same technology. The Starship was rushed into production in 1984, but the FAA had never certified a composite airframe and required significant modifications. Plagued by production delays, problems, and uncertainty, costs soared. It took five years. The first plane finally took to the air in 1989. It took longer than they thought to develop and certify the airplane, and it ended up being a more expensive airplane than a lot of people were willing to pay for in its class. You could buy an entry-level jet at that time with the same money. So there was a big wait-and-see attitude to see how it performed over time. But by the time the public and the aviation community accepted the airplane, Raytheon Beechcraft had pulled plug on production. Only 53 starships were produced. Production was ended in 1995. 
With parts and maintenance costs soaring, Raytheon decided to buy the planes back off lease and to permanently decommission them. They will eventually be shredded and incinerated in the boneyard at Evergreen Air. But some owners refused to let go. My immediate thought was, oh no, what's going to happen to my Starship? I love this airplane. I was worried about the future of this airplane and whether I'd be able to fly it for, for very long. Shearer was determined to keep his machine flying. His first step was to create his own private boneyard, buying all the Starship spare parts remaining in Raytheon's inventory. Now I have six semis worth of Starship parts in a warehouse. I subsequently bought four of those airframes to keep this airplane running with anything I don't have in the warehouse here. So essentially we got a lifetime supply of parts to keep these planes running for a very long time for very little money. But there was much more to be written in this story. In 2004, Bert Rutan was building his Spaceship One in the quest to win the $10 million X Prize by sending a manned spacecraft above 350,000 feet. A reporter doing an article on Shearer and the Starship suggested they meet the designer. We jumped in the airplane, flew over the hill, and before I knew it, we were talking to Bert Rutan. So I said, hey, let's go for a ride. And the six of us got in the Starship and went for a little test drive. And they said this airplane would be the perfect chase plane for Spaceship One. It's the only plane they could think of that could fly above 40,000 feet and yet fly down slowly enough to stay with Spaceship One, which cruises at about 115 knots. We did the first chase a couple of weeks after that first flight, and then I was back every month to six weeks and just kind of uh, became part of the program. But the fate of the starships in the boneyard at Evergreen Air remains one of the saddest in aviation history. Constructed of composite materials that cannot, like aluminum, be scrapped, melted, or recycled, they will simply be ground up and burned. Though Robert Shearer has purchased substantial parts and avionics to keep his starship flying for the foreseeable future, he cannot save them all. But he remains optimistic. Hopefully one day somebody's going to resurrect this design and build a starship too. And why?